Hello and welcome back to Voyage of a Time Wanderer. Today I am here to share my top nonfiction reads from 2022. So I am really excited to be sharing my top six nonfiction books that I've read in 2022. Uh, I know it's a little bit late for uh, end of year favorites videos. We're almost into February, but I still really wanted to share my favorite fiction and nonfiction books. So this is going to be my nonfiction video and hopefully my fiction video won't be too far behind this. I am in my new apartment, so this is my new uh, living room setup, my new filming setup. It's kind of nice because uh, we have the couch right in front of the bookcases so I can actually sit not on the floor while I'm filming. I still haven't finished kind of redecorating my shelves so my knickknacks are all over the place so that's going to shuffle around a little bit but this is the general new setup and I'm really excited to be back filming and to have uh, a nice little spot that I can sit and chat about my books. So without further ado I will get into my 2022 favorite must-read nonfiction books and I'll be starting at the bottom with number six and moving all the way up to the top to reveal my number one, my most loved, my very favorite nonfiction book from 2022. So starting at number six we have Ancestor Trouble, A Reckoning and a Reconciliation by Maud Newton. This was actually one of my most anticipated 2022 releases. It came out in March, so I was really excited to have a chance to get to it before the year was up. I read it towards the end of the year as part of my nonfiction November TBR, and I really, really enjoyed it. This is a really powerful memoir that at times I kind of felt was written specifically for me because it had uh, so many of my interests woven into it and also dealt with some really heavy topics that I have encountered in my own family history research and in my own life. So I found it both fascinating and a little bit cathartic to read. If you enjoy multi-generational nonfiction that kind of tells a family's story through time, if you have any interest in genealogy research, ancestry, family history, uh, I would highly recommend this book. But at the same time, I don't think there's too much academic -y genealogy research jargon in this book that would deter someone who didn't have that as a hobby from picking up this book, especially if you're someone who has complicated family relationships or you're dealing with estrangement. Uh, I would highly recommend this book. I think you would find it to be uh, very heavy hitting, but also to accurately reflect some of the emotions that people go through when they're dealing with these kind of problems in their families. So this book is primarily the author's experience kind of diving more deeply into her family history while also dealing with a really um, negative relationship with her father and so kind of balancing her interest in finding out more about her family history and then uncovering some fairly unpleasant truths about some of those ancestors and the way that they lived and different decisions that they made. Throughout the book the author is grappling with how she can forge her own identity uh, how she can take what is good and positive about her ancestors and the people whose uh, DNA she carries while also uh, making sure that she doesn't um, bring forward into future generations any negative inheritances of uh, racism or uh, other negative character attributes, problems with addiction and whatnot, how she can break those negative generational cycles and kind of move forward as a better future ancestor to her own descendants. So those are my thoughts on Ancestor Trouble by Maude Newton. I definitely really enjoyed it and it was a really fascinating uh, story of an American family. So that is why I ended up number six on my nonfiction favorites. Coming in at number five is The Palace Papers by Tina Brown. This is nonfiction related to the British royal family and I'm actually starting to have read uh, a fair number of uh, this kind of subgenre of royal nonfiction, particularly dealing with uh, the drama within the current generation of the royal family. So I've read Finding Freedom by Omid Scobie, I've read Courtiers by Valentine Lowe, I've read Revenge by Tom Bauer, and I've also just finished reading Spare by Prince Harry. So I've read, I guess in the last year and a half or so, I've read five different royal nonfiction books, and The Palace Paper is by far my favorite. Out of those five, I think it is the most balanced and nuanced in the approach to all sides of different uh, dramatic incidences, both past and present. 
uh, I found that it did an excellent job of dealing with kind of the more historical dramas, so like the Queen Elizabeth, Princess Margaret dramas, and the Princess Diana Charles drama, as well as the current Harry Meghan dramas. So it gave a very interesting intergenerational uh, insight into kind of how different policies and practices and um, how different events within the family have shaped uh, reactions in the present day. So if you're interested in uh, picking up some royal nonfiction and you're a little overwhelmed by all of the options that are out there now, uh, this would definitely be the place that I would recommend starting. I found it to be very readable and it stayed interesting while also being, uh, as far as I could tell, accurate. Uh, some of the other books I would pick up on things that I knew weren't entirely accurate or were uh, just factually wrong and so that automatically makes me kind of suspect the rest of the author's research because it's like if that's something that I know is wrong what am I what do I not know that is wrong whereas in this book I didn't pick up any factual errors so I'm uh, kind of leaning towards thinking that maybe this is um, more well researched and well backed up by source information. I had obviously picked this book up with the current generation of drama in mind but I actually found myself really enjoying uh, her descriptions and chapters that were detailing the events of the 80s and 90s, particularly following Princess Diana because, well, obviously uh, I have a few memories of Princess Diana being alive and I have really vivid memories of watching her funeral. I wasn't um, alive or aware uh, for a lot of, um, you know, her time in the royal family and then for her divorce from Prince Charles to unfold, uh, I wasn't following those stories because I was like an infant. <laughs> so it was really fascinating to me to go back in the palace papers and learn more about kind of what was going on behind the scenes um, from these, the broad brush strokes that I did know of her time in the royal family. So she actually has an entire biography of Princess Diana that was published in 2007. And that's definitely a book that I am interested now to pick up. Then coming in at number four, we have How Catholic Art Saved the Faith, The Triumph of Beauty and Truth in Counter-Reformation Art by Elizabeth Lev. And I do try to keep my theological nonfiction kind of separate and off of my overall nonfiction favorites because I know that it's not necessarily um, relatable or of interest for everyone watching my videos and those are kind of more books that I read uh, for myself rather than to share and discuss on YouTube. But I did want to make an exception for both this book and then the next book that I'll be talking about because I do think that there is uh, a broader audience that might be interested in them. So How Catholic Art Saved the Faith was a really fascinating read. I have always loved visiting art galleries and museums and looking at famous works of art but I've never actually read an art history book before and so it kind of opened up a whole new world of nonfiction that I'm potentially interested in because I found this to be so fascinating to read uh, in detail about these paintings and little minuscule details about color choices and placement of hands and background images and symbology in you know every little element of the paintings and now I'm like wow it would be really fascinating to read more of this kind of book because it opened my eyes to see art in a whole new way. So this book is specifically analyzing well-known works of Renaissance art and looking at them with an element as to how the artists and the patrons who were uh, commissioning this artwork were trying to use art to defend or explain elements of the Catholic faith that were specifically under attack during the Reformation. So I think this book also came along at a really good time because I had just uh, been reading the first two books in the Wolf Hall trilogy at the same time, which is following Thomas Cromwell as he was kind of kicking off the Reformation in England. So to be reading Wolf Hall and bring up the bodies at the same time that I was reading this book was really interesting because I was uh, reading in this fictional account of Thomas Cromwell, you know, how he was trying to abolish certain aspects of the Catholic faith as they transitioned into being the Church of England. And then I was reading in How Catholic Art Saved the Faith, how uh, artists 
on the main continent of Europe were trying to portray these elements in art. So I think if you have any interest in kind of the Reformation time period, uh, kind of the late Tudor period onwards, uh, both in England or in uh, the rest of Europe, I think you might find this book really interesting even if you're not reading it from a religious perspective because it really uh, add a lot of background detail about how these people were thinking about uh, the impact of religion and society and how they could portray that in art in a way that wasn't too obvious. So this book details everything from, you know, how they would analyze the specific placement of where these pieces of art should be put in the church. You know, this piece of art we want to have in the nave, this piece of art we want to have over top of the altar so that, you know, it lines up with this movement of the priest that's going to line up with the painting, or this piece of art we want to have beside a confessional because it is, you know, dealing with the sacrament of confession. So it was just really interesting to think about um, both the, all the thought that goes into uh, this art by the artist, but also uh, how it would have impacted uh, the average citizen when they went into these churches and viewed this art. I will note that I would really recommend, I think, getting a physical copy of this book. I didn't, and that is something that I do regret. So if you do pick it up, uh, I would probably recommend a physical copy. I actually started listening to it on audiobook, which is a huge mistake because I instantly realized that I wanted to have um, the works of art in front of me so that I could actually see what was um, being described. So I ended up also picking it up on ebook, uh, which did work because then I could keep the image static on my Kindle copy and listen to the audiobook description of what I should be looking for in the art. But I think having a physical copy would be really valuable to be able to uh, kind of take a closer look at these works of art. Uh, maybe they're even in color in the inserts, I'm not sure. Uh, but just being able to flip back and forth between the passages describing uh, the different elements you should be looking out for and then having the images in front. So if you do pick it up, I would highly recommend uh, tracking down a hard copy. And then number three is another book that has kind of some faith tie-ins, but I'm going to add a caveat for people who aren't interested in that. And that is Before and After, The Incredible Story of the Real Life Mrs. Wilson by Alison Wilson. This is a memoir of Alison Wilson, whose life has recently been memorialized in the TV miniseries Mrs. Wilson, where she's played by her real life granddaughter, Ruth Wilson, which is so incredibly cool to have a chance to uh, portray your own grandmother's story on screen. I can only imagine how special that must have been for Ruth Wilson. After Alison's husband, Alec, passes away, she finds out that everything in their marriage had not been as it had seemed. And there's actually an incredibly complex a web of lies, bigamy, uh, espionage uh, behind the truth of her marriage. I had actually watched the miniseries Mrs. Wilson twice in the year before I read this book and I find the whole story incredibly fascinating. I've seen a lot of reviews on Goodreads that are a little bit negative about this memoir and I think that's because they're going into it assuming that it's going to be like the miniseries Whereas this book is at its heart a faith story, it's a Catholic conversion story, and the second portion of this book, the after portion, is really entirely about her journey of faith and kind of her Christian mystic experiences rather than about the drama of her marriage. So if you're someone who isn't interested in a faith memoir, I wouldn't really recommend this book to you, but I would still highly, highly, highly recommend the miniseries, which is more based on the before section of her book and has so much drama and intrigue and is a beautifully done uh, historical drama. It's set uh, during the Second World War and the 50s and 60s so the costumes and the settings are all like superbly done and of course knowing that it is the actress's real family history brings it uh, to life in an even more real way. So the miniseries is really focused on Allison and Alex marriage and kind of her uncovering the secrets after his death and only touches very briefly on her inner faith journey. So I would obviously recommend both the book and the miniseries but they obviously do have kind of different target audiences based on whether you're more interested in reading a faith memoir or you're interested in kind of intrigue, espionage, and dramatic relationship stories. Then coming in at number two is Jane's Fame, How Jane Austen Conquered the World by Claire Harmon. 
This is a book that I read during Jane Austen July and I absolutely uh, thoroughly enjoyed my reading experience and I also found the scope of the book being focused more on Jane's fame than on her life to be really interesting and unique among the Austen biographies that I've read. So like the title suggests, this isn't really a traditional biography, rather it's almost like a microhistory examining the rise of Jane Austen's global popularity. The first two chapters do cover events from within her lifetime, but are really focused on her publishing career and the reputation that the books first had when they were originally published. Rather than starting in her childhood and moving forward, it's really detailing in on you know, how she was perceived within society as an author while she was still alive. And then the rest of the chapters are carrying on from the death of Jane Austen all the way up to the present day how she was perceived by contemporary authors, how Victorian authors thought and wrote about her and how they were influenced by her, her family's uh, original efforts to try to shape her image into that ideal spinster aunt and uh, really trying to control the public narrative about who Jane Austen was, the comfort that her books have brought people over the last 200 years through really difficult times, uh, apparently it's well documented that soldiers would often bring her books with them to the trenches and they were also very popular on the home front during both world wars. The rise of Jane Austen societies and museums dedicated to her life and work. How various strains of literary criticism have interpreted her works and, you know, kind of toyed with different ideas that she brought up. And then into the present era of Austen movie adaptations and online Janeites. I have read a few biographies now of Jane Austen and so I just found this to be a really refreshing and unique take uh, and I learned so much about how you know her public image has changed from the time she was alive to the present day, how her popularity has ebbed and flowed and it really gave me a much more broad overview of the societal impacts of her books and I think it's going to give me a greater appreciation for her work uh, going forward. So I would highly recommend Jane's Fame to anyone who likes Jane Austen, which I think are most of the people who view my videos. And uh, it's definitely a book that's going to be hard to top for future Jane Austen nonfiction. So we have finally arrived at number one, uh, my most beloved nonfiction book of 2022. And that is the only book that I have a physical copy of. And that is Amsterdam by Rushel Shorto. I've pretty much been talking about this book non-stop since I read it. I think I've mentioned it in like every non-fiction wrap-up. I've said it's going to be my favorite. I actually did do an entire book review video of this book which I will link in the cards. So if you want an even more in-depth uh, overview of this book and want to know even more of my thoughts, um, you can watch that full video review. Uh, but I literally cannot recommend this book highly enough. Like. It's a well-deserved number one on my nonfiction list for 2022. I enjoyed it so much that as soon as I finished reading it, I listened to it on audiobook actually, and it was a very well done audiobook. Uh, immediately I went to thrift books and tracked down my own copy because I knew it was a book that I was going to want to reference over and over again, and I really wanted it to be part of my own uh, genealogy library. So I did read this as part of my Reading Through My Family Tree series. Uh, which was focusing on the Dutch Golden Age in the last year. So that is why I picked it up originally and it now happily lives on my Dutch shelf of my family history bookcase. Similar to Jane's fame, this book is almost more of a micro history. So it's not just a book about the history of the Netherlands. It's not just a book about the history of Amsterdam. It's really a book about the history of small L liberalism and how that was exemplified and evolved in Amsterdam from the foundation of the city to the present day. The author examines how tensions between social and economic li liberalism have uh, shaped Amsterdam and the Netherlands more broadly, and how these ideas rippled out to impact the world more broadly to North America through the new Amsterdam colony that later became New York, to the UK when William of Orange led the Glorious Revolution and became King of the United Kingdom, and then around the rest of the world through the imperial trading uh, ambitions of the Dutch East India Company. He then follows this thread of liberalism all the way up into the 20th century and to the present day, 
to show how the policies and practices that were put into place when Amsterdam was first founded have continued to have a significant impact on the city and its perceptions. Honestly, I would highly recommend this book to anyone who enjoys historical nonfiction. I don't think you have to have a special interest in the Netherlands, but obviously if you have ever visited Amsterdam or have Dutch roots, you'd have uh, even more reason to pick this book up. But I was really surprised with how approachable and readable it is. It's got some wonderful examples of narrative nonfiction writing in it, and it brought up some really interesting points about the influence of Dutch culture globally that I'd never considered before. It's one that I could definitely see myself rereading in the future, and I definitely intend to pick up more of Rachel Shorto's nonfiction uh, very, very soon. And that is why Amsterdam is my number one nonfiction read from 2022. So I hope you enjoyed hearing a little bit about the six nonfiction books that I fell in love with in 2022. I would love to know what nonfiction picks were your very favorite reads of 2022, and I hope to be back very soon with a video about my favorite fiction reads. Until next time, enjoy wandering through the pages of a good book.